Hi, friends. Welcome to the By Faith Podcast. I'm your host, Christine Hoover, and I'm so glad you're here. Each week this season, I'm talking with a guest about a specific experience in their life, letting us step into their shoes so we can learn better how to love our brothers, sisters, family members, and neighbors. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by The Good Book Company, publisher of A Better Than Anything Christmas by Barbara Rioch. These daily family devotions for Advent give a thorough investigation of why Jesus came and how what he gives us is better than anything else we could wish for. Each day, there's a passage to read together, questions to think about, an explanation, and a prayer. There are also age-appropriate application questions, some for younger children and some for older children, as well as journaling space so that each family member can write or draw their own response to what God has shown them. Pick up a copy of A Better Than Anything Christmas at thegoodbook.com or wherever good books are sold. Support for By Faith is provided by b h Publishers, publisher of Gracie's Garden. Do you or your kids struggle to be patient? Mom, author, and business owner Laura Casey certainly knows a bit about that, but she's learned many rich lessons from the garden, including how to celebrate that God grows good things little by little. Discover the joy and wisdom the garden has to offer with big sister Gracie and her two younger siblings, Sarah and Joshua, who really are Laura's kids in real life. Plus a fun bonus, unfold the book jacket to discover a poster filled with garden giggles to keep you and your little ones laughing. Pick up a copy of Gracie's Garden wherever good books are sold. Friends, today's episode is so important, yet may not be suitable for young ears as we discuss the difficult topic of suicide. My guest is Kayla Steckline. In 2018, Kayla's husband, Andrew, died by suicide. At the time, he was a megachurch pastor who was also struggling with mental illness. Kayla joins me today for a difficult yet vulnerable conversation, helping us understand what we need to know about mental illness and suicide. In addition, she discusses what we need to understand specifically about pastors and mental illness. With increasing numbers of people dealing with mental illness and statistics showing increased suicide in our country, I believe that this is such an important conversation for the church to have. So let's get to it, friends. Here is my conversation with Kayla Steckline. Thank you so much, Kayla, for joining me on By Faith. Thanks so much for having me. Honored to be here. And I would love for you to start out with just introducing your your sweet little family of boys over there. Yeah, so we live in Southern California, and I have three busy, wild, super fun little boys. They're seven, six, and four years old right now. So right now, they're super into backflips and Uh, YouTube uh and football and surfing. My oldest son is like obsessed with surfing right now. So it's super fun. Go, go, go. Wild, wrestling, stinky, loud. That's my home every day. We're doing virtual learning. So there's that too. And so they're here all the time. (laughs) And it's fun. (laughs) They don't go anywhere. They're here all the time. Yeah, I've got three boys as well. And so I understand exactly what you're talking about. There's so much fun, but they are high energy. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I love their names too. I just got done reading your book. It's called Fear Gone Wild. And we're going to talk about that today, but the the names of your boys really stuck out to me. I thought I sat and just thought about each one because they're so unique. So can you tell us the names of them? Yeah. My oldest son's name is Smith. And then my middle son's name is Jethro. We call him Jet. And then my youngest son's name is Brave. And were those names that you guys chose because you, you know, what were the reasons that you chose yeah. those? So Smith was actually, my husband was in a wedding before we got married and there was a little ring bear and his name was Smith. And so we just loved it. It went well with their last name. It's like a strong Smith stack line, like cool, oh, strong yeah. name. We liked that it was like a kind of a last name and we're in that generation of unique names. Everyone's like trying to find unique names Uh for their kids. And so we loved that. And then our second son came six weeks early and I hadn't picked out any other names. We actually were still undecided on the name, but my husband loved the name Jethro. Before we even got married, he loved the name Jethro. He was determined to name something Jethro, like a kid or a dog or a cat or something. And so... 
we named him Jethro. And then our third son, we were really struggling by the time we had a third boy, like, oh my gosh, we have to name another boy. Like, this is so hard. And so we had a date night and we were walking through Hobby Lobby and there was a sign that said, be brave with Jeremiah 29 11 under it. And my husband's like, what if we name him brave? And I'm like, sure. So <laughs> By that point, you run out of like, ideas, cool. like whatever. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Does he live up to his name? You know, it's so funny because he, out of the three of them, is like the most sensitive and just like cuddly and warm mm-hmm. and sweet. But he is brave. It just looks different, um, I think, than we typically think that brave looks. Mm-hmm. Like it's not, it's more of a quiet strength for him. Mm-hmm. That's great. I mean, that'll be something that he can, you know, that's something you can call him to, which I, I love that. I love that name. Well, you've written a new book, Kayla, called Fear Gone Wild, coming out soon. And in it, you talk about the most challenging situation of your life, season of your life. And that was losing your husband to suicide. So we're, I, I'm glad we're going to have this conversation, but I understand that this is, this is a difficult conversation, but could you take us back to that time in your life? And just, you know, we're not looking for all the juicy de- details, but we, we just want to be able to know what you've walked through. Yeah. So I was living my dream life just a few years ago. You know, I really truly had everything I could ever wish for or ask for or dream for. I had a wonderful husband. We were raising these three beautiful boys together. We were living in our dream home. I had the mom car. I had found my you know, niche as pastor's wife. I was serving in the women's ministry and serving on the mops team and really just was thriving. I loved being a pastor's wife. I loved sitting on the front row on Sunday mornings, like watching my husband stand on the stage and give the message. Like I got to be his wife and it was such an honor. And then in the fall of 2017 is kind of when things started to shift. He started experiencing panic attacks and they were happening very often about three to four times a week and super debilitating. It would take over his whole body, mostly when he would try to go to sleep. Um, And it was just all consuming. So I, um, I describe it as in the book as fear gone wild. It's like this fear crept into his mind, crept into his body, and it just would spread all throughout his body. And I could tell he was having a panic, panic attack just by the look in his eyes. His eyes would glaze over and he wouldn't be there anymore. And so those were happening three to four times a week from about October 2017 until April of 2018. And we were doing everything we knew to do to try to like understand why those were happening. Um, And he actually ended up having a massive one that landed him in the hospital in April. And that's when we all decided like like me and our family and the board at the church were like, okay, enough is enough. He's been having these panic attacks. They're not going away. We don't know what's going on. The doctors don't have answers for us because he was doing tests trying to figure out what was going on. And the doctors didn't have any answers. And so we thought, well, maybe he's just burned out. Maybe he's just tired. He's been running fast, running hard in ministry in 2011 when his dad was diagnosed with leukemia. And so he had led, and his dad was the lead pastor of our church. Mm -hmm. And so he had led our church through a very difficult season. And then ultimately his dad passed away in 2015. And so he had led our church strong through a lot at a very young age. We were raising these three boys. He's grieving the loss of his father. So there were a lot of factors involved. And so we thought, man, he's just tired. He never stopped. He never took time to grieve the loss of his dad. We have these three little boys. Like maybe he just needs to rest. And so in April of 2018, we put him on a sabbatical and we put zero timeline on it. There wasn't an expected return day. It was just open-ended, like take as much time as you need to rest and get healthy. And we want you to be the pastor. We want you back, but we want you to be healthy. Like your health is more important. And so the board was super honest. They got on stage and they told the church, you know, Andrew is struggling with panic attacks and anxiety and He's going to take some time off. And so just a few weeks later, he was diagnosed with depression. Um, And he was really relieved to have a diagnosis, finally understand why he had been having these panic attacks. And so we started on this journey of depression and mental illness and anxiety. Um, Depression and anxiety were kind of the main two things that he struggled with. 
And we were doing everything we knew to do to get him better. He was seeing a psychiatrist every other week. He was taking medication. We were seeing a therapist for two hours every single week. He went on solo trips by himself to go spend time in solitude and spend time with God. He went to Colorado and spent time with a mentor. We did a road trip, just the two of us. Like we were really trying to tackle it head on. He was exercising and eating healthy and had gained weight and gained muscle. And we were really trying to do what we could do to get him healthy so we could go back to work. And so um, at the end of July, the doctors actually thought he was getting better. And so they released him to go back to work in August. And he really hit the ground running. He gave two powerful messages on mental illness. He called the series Hot Mess, and he was using his own experience with depression and anxiety as the example. And he talked about suicide. He gave out the suicide hotline number. He talked about depression. He quoted facts from the NAMI website. Like he really knew all the facts and he would have known where to go for help. Mm -hmm. And headed into the third week, he just had a really awful day at the office. You know, his mind wasn't fully healed. He told our staff and told our family when he went back to work, he was at about 65%. Mm -hmm. And so he wasn't at 100%. His mind wasn't fully healed. And so he wasn't able to process the information he received that day in the office like he normally would. Mm -hmm. And so we quickly realized like, whoa, 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 we need to pump the brakes. Like maybe he's not better. Like maybe he shouldn't have gone back to work. And so while we were away from him for just a little bit, working on a plan, finding a guest speaker for Sunday, trying to call in patient places, like maybe that would have been an option for him. And while we were away from him for a little bit, he attempted suicide and we were completely shocked completely stunned, like really, truly never saw it coming. Even the doctors, all the doctors that were surrounding him, his team of doctors were completely shocked and stunned. And so he was rushed to the hospital. They ran a bunch of tests and unfortunately there was nothing they could do. And so on August 25th, 2018, Andrew died and went to be with Jesus. And I was handed a brand new life as a widow and single mom of three little boys who were two four and five at the time of his death. Wow. I'm so sorry. And just reading the story of all of that, you're very honest about the road leading up to that day and everything after. And I, I would love to know why you chose so quickly to, to let people know that that's what happened. You used the word suicide almost immediately to let people know and to let the church know. Can you, can you tell us why that was important to you? You know, I, I didn't even really um, think about it. We were in the hospital. He was on life support. The doctors were running tests and I posted the very first post to Instagram um, that I think said something like, Andrew attempted suicide this morning. Like, please pray, like, please, please pray for healing. And I honestly just wanted people to pray. I genuinely believed with enough prayer and intercession, like Andrew would be saved. Andrew would be healed. Like he would wake up. And then our story just made the headlines. I mean, our family picture, big headlines, like Southern California pastor committed suicide, like all around the world, you know, in all different languages, our family picture and Andrew's story was making the news. And so just a few days after he passed away, um, I decided to write him a letter. And I, for me, I was going to decide, um, I was going to define Andrew's life by the way he lived, not the way he died. And I immediately saw his suicide through a lens of empathy and compassion and saw it as something that happened to him and not something he chose. And I still believe that, you know, his mind was sick. He wasn't able to think rationally in that moment. He was overcome with pain. I will truly never understand what those moments leading up to the suicide were like for him. And so I chose to believe that he died by suicide. He didn't commit suicide. He didn't choose suicide. He died by suicide. And it was an absolute tragedy. And no one was to blame. Like, he is not to blame. I am not to blame. It isn't anybody's fault. And it's a tragedy. And so that's how I approached it. And I wrote him this letter just a few days later and just said, I'm sorry. 
like, I am so sorry that you felt so misunderstood. I am so sorry that you felt so alone. I am so sorry you were carrying all of this pain. Like, I truly did not understand. And I don't think that's always the response to suicide. I think a lot of the times when somebody dies by suicide, we try to brush it under the rug. And Mm -hmm. we're afraid of that word. That word stirs up feelings of discomfort in us. And we don't like to say it. And we want to tuck it away. And we want to hide it. And we're ashamed of about it. And our family's response was just to tackle it head on. We weren't ashamed. And I think because of our understanding that this was something that happened to him, this wasn't something that he ever would have chosen. If Andrew were here today, he would be just as shocked as the rest of us that this happened to him. Mm. Can you explain more? You do talk about that in the book, that just even the terms that we use, um, that saying committed suicide is like, it's a crime. Uh, similar to committing murder, but, um, or how we would use the term committing murder and that you say that he had died by suicide and that he did not choose that. Could you, can you help us understand what you mean and how we can better think about suicide? Yeah. You know, what I've learned in my journey as I've sought to better understand all of it is that the words decision and committed are the wrong words to attach to suicide. These words actually heap more shame and blame onto the shoulders of the person who died. Also a word we use for phrases like committed a sin or committed murder or committed a crime. It ignores the fact that the suicide is often the result of an underlying mental illness. If someone had a heart condition and experienced a heart attack, we wouldn't say that person committed a heart attack. Dying by suicide is the same. That's why I believe died by suicide is the best phrase to use. It clearly sends the message that the death was caused by a mental condition, not a decision. And what I've learned is that our words matter. Like our words matter. The way we talk about it matters. The way that I talk about it to my children matters. Like I want them to see this as something that happened to their dad and not something that he would have ever chosen. And honestly, it's so freeing and so healing to have that perspective because you're not pointing the finger at anybody like really truly no one is to blame this is an absolute tragedy that resulted from an underlying real physical illness that was happening in his body that was out of control did you though struggle with the idea right after he died that maybe there was something you could have done differently or that did you have regrets that you had to work through Oh, totally. Oh, consumed, absolutely consumed with regrets. And for the first two months, my therapist explained to me that the trauma, there was so much trauma from those few days. And in my mind, you know, that I'd never walked through anything like that before. So in my mind, that trauma and that experience just floated around and was always at the forefront of my mind. And in my mind, I, I'd continued to try to save him over and over and over again. My brain would come up with different scenarios of how I, how I should have and how I could have saved him. Mm-hmm. And that that lasted for months. I mean, all throughout the day, all throughout the night, I would have nightmares about it. I would break down during the day, all the coulda, woulda, shouldas. And that's that's the um, just the pain of suicide. You know, everybody that loves that person would have done anything that they could possibly do to save them. Like even my husband's, one of his close friends in Australia was like, I should have done more. I should have called it more. Like everybody that loved him would have done anything to step in and save him. And so everyone that loved him has that, that same um, regrets and shoulda, coulda, wouldas that I have, you know, maybe to a smaller degree, but but it's just part of grieving a suicide. There is that component to it. And I think what was helpful for me, um, I went to therapy for an hour every single week for the first year and a half. And over time, I was able to create that file folder in my mind to put all of that trauma and all of that experience into. And so instead of it circulating around all the time and instead of revisiting it and trying to solve it and trying to save him, I was able to tuck it away and only pull it out when I felt like I needed to. Mm, That's good. That's really good. You do say in the book that there are things that you would go back and, and do what, what are those things? 
Yeah, the main thing that I've learned that I, you know, that I really do regret is that there was one time that Andrew did mention suicide. And I talk about it in the book and I'll never forget it. We were, it was at the end of the day, the boys had gone to bed and I was completely exhausted. You know, that summer was really difficult for me. It was really difficult for my husband, but as a caretaker, it was very difficult too, because I was torn between caring for my three boys who were home for the summer four and five. It's just fighting and young and just wild. You know, they're not napping and it's just crazy throughout the day. And then my husband who's sick and who's spending most of his time back in the bedroom. And so I was torn between being caretaker for him and mother to my kids. And I was just completely exhausted. Mm -hmm. And so one day at the end of the day, we were sitting at the kitchen counter and I was explaining to him how I was feeling. And he was explaining to me how he was feeling. And he said that he was up in the night, in the middle of the night, the night before, and he had all his staff organization charts spread all over the kitchen counter. And he was trying to figure out how to organize the staff for when he returned to work. And he thought about killing himself. And I was so shocked. And that word triggered me um, so deeply that I reacted out of my own exhaustion and my own emotion. I didn't respond out of empathy and love. I reacted. And my reaction to him was, Andrew, that is the most selfish thing you could ever do. You would never do that to me and the boys. Like, I cannot believe you said that. Like, that would never happen. You know that you could never do that. And I just like kind of attacked him, you know, instead of like leaning in and asking questions and responding with a heart of love, like I just was like, how dare you? And I really truly believed that it would never happen. I really truly believed that he was just being dramatic and that he, his mental illness wasn't that bad and that he would never do that to our family. I, I didn't understand suicide. I didn't understand that it was a pain issue, um, that, he, that he was trying to tell me in that moment that he was overwhelmed with pain. It was a pain problem. And so, what I wish I would have done is I wish I would have leaned in. I wish I would have shut my mouth and opened my ears. I wish I would have asked him questions like, what problem are you trying to solve through suicide? Do you have a suicide plan? Like, how often do you think about it? When and how would you do it? Um, I wish I would have asked him about it every single day. I wish I would have brought it up all the time. I never brought it up again. He said it one time, and I didn't tell his psychiatrist. I didn't tell his therapist. I didn't tell our family, and I never brought it up again because I really, truly believed that it was off the table and that it would never happen, but it did. And unfortunately, we're seeing, um, we've seen some high-profile pastors who have died by suicide in the past few years. Could you, in, including your husband, and, and could you help us understand why that might be and how we can better love and support our pastors? Yeah, I think pastors often get put on this pedestal and we think that they are immune to pain, that they are immune to mental health issues, that they're immune to illness, that they are just like so close to God and that nothing ever bad could happen to them. And we look up to them so much, you know, and what I've, what I've learned through our journey and even being a pastor's wife for a short period of time is that pastors are people too. Pastors aren't superhuman, they're human. And in their humanity, they're susceptible to the same stressors and pain and illness as the rest of us. Andrew had this book that was his favorite book. He read it multiple times. It's called Leaning on Empty, and I would highly recommend it to any pastor. It's by Wayne Cordero. And in the book, uh, Wayne Cordero talks about ministry fatigue and burnout. And he talks about how it's not uncommon in pastors. And he shares his personal story of his journey through that. And some of the statistics that he shares in that book are so shocking. Um, things like 50% of pastors feel unable to meet the needs of the job. 90% feel inadequately, inadequately trained to deal with ministry demands. 70% of pastors do not have someone they consider a close friend. 45.5% of pastors say they have experienced depression or burnout to the extent that they needed to take a leave of absence for ministry. 
So pastors aren't perfect. Pastors are human. You know, even Jesus was human and we have to have so much empathy and so much compassion and we need to pray for our pastors and we need to, if our pastors say that they're struggling, like we need to respect that and and give them grace and give them space. And I think oftentimes when people serve at a church or work on staff at a church, they're afraid to talk about their own mental health issues because they're afraid of losing their job. They're afraid that it'll disqualify them for ministry and that'll disqualify them from their job. Mm -hmm. And to that, I want to say just mental illness isn't a faith issue. Like it's not a sin issue. It's not a faith issue. It doesn't mean you don't have enough faith. It doesn't mean you're not close to God. Like Andrew was running to God during his depression. Often times I would walk into our bedroom and he would be blasting worship music and his big silver headphones and laying on the bed and weeping. And he was running to God with his pain. Mm -hmm. He was close to God. He was drawing near to the presence of God and his pain. And he still died by suicide. So mental illness is a real physical illness. It isn't a faith issue. And I think um, the church is doing better at understanding that, but I think we still have a long way to go in bridging the gap between mental health and ministry. Mm -hmm. So what would you want us to understand or know about mental illness? Just that it's a real physical illness. You know, it's just as real as cancer. It's just as real as any other physical illness, and it needs to be treated with the same tender care, empathy, and compassion. You know, we're so quick to, when we find out someone has cancer, um, we're so quick to set up a meal train and to check in on them and to send cards and to send flowers and to, you know, make sure people are there for them. And I think oftentimes when someone's struggling with mental illness, with depression or any other kind of mental illness. I just have my own experience with depression with my husband. So that's what I'm familiar with, but any kind of mental illness, you know, it deserves the same kind of response. It deserves the same kind of love. It deserves the same kind of community showing up and sitting with them and carrying the pain with them and being there for them and checking in on them. Like I think oftentimes it makes us feel uncomfortable. And so we, we check out and we don't call or we don't text or we don't show up because we don't know what to say. And we're afraid we're going to say the wrong thing. And so instead of saying something, we don't say anything. Mm -hmm. And so just to understand that when someone tells you that they're struggling with depression or maybe tells you that they're struggling with suicidal ideation, that it's not a time to just tell them that they need to pray more or read their Bible more. It's a time to sit with them in their pain. It's a time to listen actively. It's a time to lean in. It's a time to be present. And if they don't pick up the phone when you call, you can leave an encouraging voicemail. If they don't text you back. You can text them anyway. If they don't answer the door when you show up, you can leave something on their doorstep. Like there are ways to love people even when they're hard to love. Mm -hmm. Um, Oftentimes mental illness, people check out and they're, they're isolate themselves and because they're overwhelmed with pain and they're exhausted and there's, you know, different symptoms of mental illness. And so oftentimes they don't have a lot of energy to be present in relationships. Um, but we can continue to pursue them and to love them where they're at in their pain and to keep trying to reach in and sit with them and, and just empathize with them and carry the pain with them. Mm -hmm. That's so helpful. I'd like to talk about for you following your husband's death. Now you, you said everything that you had dreamed of would change. You have this new life you didn't ask for, didn't want. Um, can you talk about that time and what other people did that was helpful to you in your grief? Right away, I was absolutely surrounded by love and support. Like that was the most beautiful part of the way just the big C church responded, the way our community responded. I was surrounded by love and community and people that were there for us and would drop anything to come help with the kids or do whatever I need them to do. And so I'm so grateful for that response. And I think one of the best things I did for my healing um, right away was to put my three boys into school full time. I needed space. If I was going to heal, I needed space to heal. And so I put them all three into this wonderful private Christian school and they went like 8.30 in the morning till 4.30 every day. And I didn't feel bad about it. I didn't let myself have mom guilt about it. It really helped me to have that space and time to 
allow my pain to lead me. You know, if, if that day my grief led me to the cemetery, I would let it lead me and I would go sit at the cemetery and I would weep and I would cry and I would talk to Andrew and I would walk around and just sit there as long as I needed to. If that grief led me to the ocean, you know, the ocean has been a really healing place for us. And so if it led me there just to go sit on the beach and stare at the vastness of the ocean and feel how small I am. Like I would allow it to lead me there. If the grief led me to my bed and I told me I needed to rest, like I would do that for the day. And so I really just gave myself a lot of space and a lot of grace to find healing, to step towards the pain, to allow the pain to um, just come into my life and be a part of my life. And I think having that space allowed me to walk through that season and to walk through the pain and I didn't try to go around it I didn't try to go over it or under it or around it I just walked straight through it head on and you know what there's there's been this little phrase that I've developed for myself in this season of walking through loss and rebuilding my life and I call it rebuilding beautiful And I had this beautiful life with my husband, Andrew, like I really, truly loved my life and it was beautiful and that life died and I was handed this new life and I really, truly believe that this new life can still be beautiful. It's going to be a totally different kind of beautiful than it was before, but I am choosing to believe that beauty is still possible. And so that first year I said yes to a lot of opportunities too. Like not only did I create space, but I also said yes, like I got on an airplane and went to Australia. I got on an airplane and took my three boys to Israel. I got on an airplane and visited friends and family and we chose we chose life. You know, we Andrew died, but we chose to continue to live and to continue to choose joy, to defiantly choose joy in the face of loss and pain. And so that's been our, you know, our life these last few years is choosing joy, saying yes to opportunities, walking through the open doors and choosing to believe that beauty is still possible. And that doesn't mean that we are not overcome with pain. Like me and my boys all have our own unique pain that we will carry with us for the rest of our lives. Um, But I am believing that that we can build that beautiful life around that deep pain. I've noticed that you're using that hashtag on Instagram and and sharing that. And I, I would encourage anybody who needs to, you know, understand more about what that, how they can do that in their own grief to head on over to Kayla's Instagram. I'd love for us to be able to step into your shoes and, you know, you're already serving us so well through this, this new book and through being willing to talk about your experience to help other people. And so I'm thinking about for people who are listening, who they know the pain of mental illness because they're, they are themselves walking through that right now, or they have considered suicide. What would you say to them, Kayla? I would say to keep finding a way to live with the pain. Uh, What I've learned these last few years is that living with the pain is possible. You know, when I've, I've struggled with suicidal thoughts these last few years, because the pain is so overwhelming and it feels like it's never going to end. I wake up to the same horrible reality every single day, the reality that I'm a single mom, the reality that my husband's gone, the reality that I'm the sole provider for my family. Like I wake up to that reality every single day. And there are some days where that reality is absolutely overwhelming and heavy. And there are some days where I do not know if I'm going to be able to carry the weight of it all. And the pain is so overwhelming. And I sometimes see death as the solution to that pain. Um, But what I would say is that living, what I've found is that living with the pain is possible, that it's possible to have that overwhelming pain and find a way to live with it. And so what I would say to someone that's struggling with overwhelming pain or struggling with suicidal thoughts or struggling with mental illness is that I am so deeply sorry for your pain. I am so sorry that you feel so alone. I am so sorry that you're having to carry it day in and day out. And I would encourage you to keep finding a way to live with it, to keep reaching out to the people who love you. There is a sea of people surrounding you that want to be invited into your pain. Like let them in, let them sit with you, let them share in your pain, let them carry the burden with you. They want to carry it with you. 
reach out to the therapist, reach out to the specialist, like keep choosing life, keep being brave, keep finding a way to rebuild over and over and over again and to keep choosing life every single day because life is worth living. And even if you have that pain for the rest of your life, like life is worth living and you can still have a beautiful life that can surround that pain. What would you say to those who are in the shoes that you were in before Andrew died and they're trying to care for a loved one who is struggling with mental illness? I would encourage them to create space for themselves to fill back up. Uh, pouring out every single day and serving your loved one um, selflessly, really serving your loved one who's struggling is exhausting. And so I wish I would have done a better job at creating margin for myself to go spend time alone, to go fill back up, to go spend time with friends, to invite people in. You know, I also didn't do a very good job of inviting people into my pain during that season. I was, I think, um, I had a hard time because my husband was the pastor to a lot of my friends. And so I was afraid to tell them what he was really dealing with because I didn't want them to judge him or look down on him or lose respect for him. And so I struggled to let people into our pain. So I would say, let people into your pain like you have pain too and find space to fill yourself back up like you cannot keep pouring out from an empty reservoir you have to fill yourself back up so that you can pour out and love your loved one and your family um, the best that you can Mm -hmm. well kayla's book is called fear gone wild and it is an excellent book I am so glad, Kayla, that you've written this book because this is a needed resource for people, for Christians especially, that we can learn how to respond to those who are, have mental illness or who have experienced suicide and, and from one of their family members. So thank you for being willing to do that for us, to serve the Christ body in this way. Thank you so much for the encouragement and support and for being brave with me in the conversation today. I really, really appreciate it. You are someone you know is contemplating suicide. You can receive help 24 hours a day by calling 1-800-273-8255. Kayla's new book is called Fear Gone Wild and I highly recommend it for anyone who is struggling with mental illness or who loves someone who is struggling. I put a direct link to the book in the show notes for this episode. Friends, join me next week as I chat with Denise Cabrera. Denise and her husband Felix are planting a church in their native Puerto Rico. God called them back home after Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico a few years ago, and they left the church they planted in Oklahoma to obey God and start over. Denise shares what it's like to be a church planting wife and both the joys and challenges of following and obeying God. So whether you're in ministry or not, as you listen to Denise, you will be encouraged to persevere in serving the Lord wherever He has you. Join me next week, and until then, keep walking forward by faith.